Hello, everybody. Welcome to our beautiful William G. McGowan Theater. I am Thoda Klo. I'm the executive director of the Foundation for the National Archives. The Foundation is extremely proud to be an ongoing partner with the National Archives, especially in getting the word out to a larger audience about the depth and diversity of the treasures here, as well as the archives' important role as a federal agency. We have done this by working closely with the archives to help produce programs and exhibits, publications, websites, and much, much more. So I want to thank you guys for hearing the word and coming here tonight. I know there's weather and all sorts of challenges, but I want to thank you all. And I also have to thank, because we are extremely grateful to, the William G. McGowan Fund. Their very generous support has not only made this magnificent theater possible, but they continue to be fabulous partners. The fund has been a tremendous advocate for high quality programming here at the National Archives. In fact, this annual program on women in leadership was created through the partnership based on Sue Jin McGowan's idea of offering regular programming that could both serve to educate and inspire the young women who will be the leaders of tomorrow. And so 2011 boasts our fourth year in hosting this forum. And over the past years, in, in my opinion, these women in leadership programs have been incredible. And we featured such topics as, in 2008, we did Citizens by Choice, which was about women in business leadership. In 2009, we featured women in political leadership. And last year, in 2010, we featured leaders in journalism. So the people you're going to hear from tonight are all powerhouses. Diverse in their backgrounds and their contributions, not only in the field of academics, but also in their terms of influences on society and American culture as a whole. And I welcome our entire panel here to the National Archives tonight. But I have to say, as a graduate from the university, Oahu Wa, Virginia, <laughs> I am especially excited to have Teresa Sullivan on our panel. I went to UVA, oh, now I got to admit this, in the early 1970s, I know a billion years ago, and even though women had started to be admitted to the university on an open admission policy instead of a quota system, not all of the men appreciated having women on campus. And now I'm especially glad that there's a woman in charge. <laughs> so my next order of business, if you all look at your programs, was actually to introduce Diana Spencer, who is a powerhouse in her own right. As the first and current executive director of the William G. McGowan Fund, she also has experience in the medical as well as the academic fields. So although she will be joining us for the program, another commitment has kept her schedule really, really tight. And she's asked me to please pass along her welcome and her thanks on behalf of the entire McGowan Fund family. Well, now, it's really I get to introduce the gentleman who's officially going to welcome you here because it is his house. And that's the Archivist of the United States. From spending time in the Navy, to shelving books in the libraries at MIT, to the Duke University libraries, to leading the New York City public library system, David is our first librarian archivist. For those of you who have met him, you understand how delighted we are that David is here in Washington, DC, and at the helm of the National Archives. And I am delighted to welcome David Ferriero as the Archivist of the United States to the stage. Thank you, Thoda. And I add my welcomes to my house tonight and to the William G. McGowan Theater. I'd also like to express my thanks to Sue Jin, who can't be with us tonight, and to the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund for everything they do for us, including this program. And if you keep your eye on that seat right there next to Thoda, that's where Diana will, uh, will show up. Uh, and also, my thanks to 
Diana for joining us tonight. Tonight's topic is especially timely in light of the recent release of Women in America, Indicators of Social and Economic Well-Being, prepared for the White House Council on Women and Girls. Highlights of the section on education include women's gains in educational attainment have significantly outp outpaced those of men over the last 40 years. Female students score higher than males on reading assessments and lower than males on mathematic assessments. Higher percentages of women than men aged 24 to 25 to 34 have earned a college degree. More women than men have received a graduate education. Women earn the majority of confirmed, confirmed, conferred degrees overall, but earn fewer degrees than men in science and technology. Higher percentages of women than men participate in adult education. We have with us tonight four women who sit in the president's chairs at some of our most distinguished institutions of higher education, the University of Virginia, Vassar, Wellesley, and Kenyon Colleges. And to lead a discussion on the challenges they face, I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of tonight's program, Donnie Campbell, Associate Dean of Faculty at Toro College in New York City. She has studied the difficulties female educational leaders have had on their way to the presidencies. Her book, Learning Leadership, Women Presidents of Colleges and Universities, was published last year. She also conducts seminars and workshops on the very issues being discussed tonight. Dean Donnie Kempel and our panel. Um, let me first introduce our distinguished panel. Um, I'd like to introduce, I will say president once, they're presidents all, Kim Bottomley, Catherine, uh, Kim Bottomley from Wellesley College, Catherine Hill Vassar College, Georgia Nugent Kenyon College, and Teresa Sullivan, the University of Virginia, and I don't know what you said, Wawa? Wow, wow. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, we're talking tonight about women, <clears throat> college presidencies, and leadership. Um, I, I just want to give you a little background. I'm sure a lot of you know a lot about the subject, but uh, researching my book brought new stuff to my attention, and um, I think it's worth repeating. Um, in the words of our wonderful sponsor, the Archives, Women continue to carve a path to the top of academic leadership in major colleges and universities and lead the biggest and best academic institutions. These facts are very true. And tonight, you see before you four accomplished women who have come through academe to assume these most important roles. At the same time, as leaders, they represent role models to the next generation of leaders. And we are here tonight, in some respects, to discuss their journeys to the presidency and why and if they aspire, aspire to be presidents, and now that they're there, have they achieved their goals? I hope we will discuss uh, during this session and the answer, question and answer period, career expectations, opportunities, mentors, obstacles, and ultimately, what worked. I hope we can also have a few minutes to discuss the future of women in academic leadership. Before we begin with the questions, uh, how about a few statistics? Um, I think a few of us have seen the articles on gender parity in higher education, including uh, the, one, the study at, of women in MIT, and the survey results uh, at a, an Ivy League college showing that women don't always go for high profile, students don't go for high profile leadership positions. Um, but where are we now and where are we with as far as leadership is concerned? Women right now hold 23% of college presidencies in the United States. That's up two points from a few years ago and the progress has slowed. Women hold 494 presidencies out of 2,148. The distribution is at doctoral institutions, 13.8%, that's 28 presidents, masters, 21.5, 96 presidents, baccalaureate, 97 presidents, 23%, and associate's degree, almost 29%, which is where most of the women are serving at this time, 215 presidents. So now we're going to start with our questions. 
Uh, I'm going to throw one out that I think we're going to be answering all along our discussion period. Is there still discrimination keeping qualified women, such as all of you here on the panel tonight, from being offered presidencies, or for some reason are women not seeking college presidencies? Um, if women don't seek the position, why not? Why is there 23%? And I think I glossed over one of the statistics um, that I'll get to a little bit later on. Um, the first question I thought I'd throw <coughs> out to us all is, did you all plan to be presidents? <laughs> Most of you, if not all of you, started as faculty members on a tenure track. And you rose through the academic, what we call the academic pipeline. You went right through it, got to the presidency. Did you plan it? And if you planned it, um, I, I know somebody has, somebody has said the following quote that, women who aspire to the presidency should see themselves as leaders and then follow through with specific actions. Do you agree with this philosophy? Who would like to start? <laughs> yeah. In other words, not you. Yeah, that was, I kind of started that way, right? That works, right? I'll start. We have to start somewhere. Um, because uh, my story is that I, I don't think that I set out for a presidency when I was a faculty member, as you said, Donnie. Uh, when I decided to move from being a full-time faculty member to administrative work, which was in the early 90s, at that point, yes, I had in mind that I wanted a presidency, and we may talk about that later. However, my husband tells me that for 20 years I was collecting books about the presidency. <laughs> Dead giveaway. <laughs> so I may be an unreliable <laughs> witness. I don't know. Could you please identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Georgia Nugent, Kenyon College. And I'm Terry Sullivan, the University of Virginia. Um, when I was a college senior, the president of my university, Clifton R. Wharton, who was president of Michigan State, um, invited me to become an intern in his office for six months. And so I had a chance to see a presidency up close and personal, and also to get some direct mentoring from him. And one of the things he said to me was, well, you don't really aim to be president, but you aim to be the best faculty member that you can be. And to do that, you have to get a PhD, and so you have to leave here and go to graduate school. And he kicked me out. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to graduate school. Yeah, and I agree with that, actually. I, uh, sometimes the students at Wellesley College say, you know, did you plan when you graduated from college to be a college president? And, and I had to say, you know, that didn't even occur to me. Uh, my ambition was to be a scientist, to be an academic scientist, to have the best science career I could have, to ask those questions that excited me. Uh, and that's what I did. And somewhere along the line, you start doing things that lead you more into the administrative route. And you realize you're good at those things. And that leads you to different interests. And I think that's, there's a lot to be said about that for everyone's life, that you graduate from college and you think you're going to be one thing, but life takes funny turns. And you kind of go with where your strengths are and you sort of capitalize on you know, what you want to do ultimately. And so for me, becoming president was very much after a long uh, and pretty successful career as a scientist. I'm Kathy Hill from Vassar. And uh, I think our stories are very similar. I, I'm an economist, uh, so when I finished, uh, got into graduate school and finished up my PhD, I had to make a decision about whether to go into academics or to go into, say, the nonprofit area. You also could go in the profit direction, but that was not what, what I was interested in. But you know, maybe the, I do open economy macro, maybe the Fed or the IMF or the World Bank, and I ended up going into academics. And again, you go and the first thing you're worried about is continuing to be a professional <laughs> economist and getting, figuring out how to teach and. Uh, figuring out how to do the things you're doing as, as, a, as an academic. And then I think many of our institutions are institutions where they do ask the faculty to become involved in, in the governance structure. And so you, you get some opportunities to be in charge of a particular area. And, and I think certainly for us, certainly for me, um, I, I found that it was fun, it was interesting, uh, and I was pretty good at it, and that it could have an impact more more broadly on the institution than my work as an individual faculty member, and I found that both interesting and satisfying. Well, thank you. The next question has 
to do a lot with the number of women who are assuming presidencies or the lack of a large number of women assuming the presidencies. Um, as I noted before, 23% of American, 23% uh, of uh, presidencies are held by women. However, women represent 57% of the student bodies, if not more, and that's across the, or across the campuses. Should there be a, a correlation between the percent of women students in higher education and the number of women leaders on those campuses? And uh, in here, I would include not just the president, but provosts and other academic leaders who serve as role models. Um, you know, we all talked about the academic pipeline. Um, in order to become an academic leader, in most cases, you need to be in the academic pipeline. Do you see more women coming up now? Do you see the, the number of presidencies held by women increasing? So I might just start that. Um, I think it's very important that the, the university or college environment uh, at almost all levels, faculty levels, administrative le levels, even in staff levels, um, represent what the student body looks like. So the students see role models for themselves and the people that they interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I would absolutely answer that if 57% of the student body are women, then there ought to be um, women faculty members uh, that are equivalent to those numbers. There ought to be women administrators. And overall, as you look through college and universities, presidents that represent that. And I think that's also very true for uh, men and women of color, that that also needs to be uh, a very important dynamic that uh, happens on a campus, that you also have those role models in place. I, I um, agree, and obviously there's going to be a bit of a lag. As you mentioned, the number of women presidencies has gone up, and I think it will continue to go up. Uh, I actually think one of the scariest uh, things about that 50% number is, is that we're losing young men and that actually young men are not making it uh, to college and on to graduate school. So we're, in, we're at, at a very interesting moment and I realize that this panel is about women's leadership, no, but, but as the mother of two sons, I worry about those data <laughs> for the boys. That's a very, very interesting, it's a very interesting point. Um, we've all seen those studies as well. Uh, but while you're answering, while you continue to answer the questions, um, do you specifically hire women? Do you knowing that uh, knowing the statistic well, that you know that you that you want to see role models and that you want to to increase the presence of women leaders is is that something that you think about that you know when you're hiring um, you should hire a balance or you hire more women than men or your two sons are looking for jobs. Or, <laughs> you know. I will say something about that from personal experience, and, and I agree with my colleagues here that it would seem rational that there be a kind of representation that uh, approximately uh, mirrors the, the student body and the numbers of uh, degree recipients and so forth. Um, I will say that I do think there are still barriers out there. Uh, when I came to my college, uh, I have What's, what's called a senior staff at some colleges or a, a, a cabinet and in other institutions. And it's about 12 people. And those are the senior officers of the university, provost, dean, and so forth uh, of the college. And um, during my tenure, I've now been in the presidency eight years. During my tenure for a number of those years, I had a senior staff that was 50-50. And it wasn't entirely intentional, but I thought it was a good thing to work in that direction. And um, I, another position came open in that group, and I was basically told by several of my trustees that I'd better hire a man. Um, and it was, it was a pretty strong directive that, you know, to be 50-50 is, uh, is of concern to some. I also had some concerns from another alumnus of my institution, which led me to worry about the education that we provide, because... <laughs> <laughs> provided, 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 provided. Because that person, in a very friendly way, sig uh, sort of um, singled me out at a reception that I was holding at the president's home on the campus, 
And he singled me out and said, um, Georgie, don't you think there are too many women here? And I said, well, I, I thought it would be appropriate if that we're more or less kind of, as if we mirror the population, at which point it became clear to me that he assumed there were more men than women in the United States. So <laughs> I thought, did you tell him he was wrong? Okay. Uh, no, I probably just refreshed his drink. I'm That's not sure. Right. <laughs> 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 I've had enough of those already. <laughs> it's, um, it, here, here's, a, here's a little teaser, and I think you'll see that some, there's crossover in some of, uh, of these issues. Um, my research showed that women presidents who attended at least one single gender school were more likely to achieve leadership success. Uh, I talked about it with someone at our reception. And it, it always, the reason it stuck with me is that several women presidents said it. Um, there are authors, I believe the name is Tidball, and that's all they research is going through the Forbes lists and going through um, Fortune 500 companies to see which women went to single gender school. Now, we know it's single, we have a, we have people, somebody here from a single gender school, and we have somebody whose school was single gender, but the other gender. So <laughs> what, what do you all think about that? I mean, I, if you're a girl in an all-girls school, there's no boys to do anything. And there's, in, am I wrong? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Right? Women are the leaders. Women are the student body presidents. Women play sports, right? So does that make a difference? I mean, my response to that would be that this is actually a testable question and we could actually collect the data and get the answer to it. Oh, all right. Um, but, Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that won't keep us from speculating on the answer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I think you can do it either way. I'm, I'm somebody that went to uh, an undergraduate institution that was all men and had gone co-ed the year before I went. And then I went on to graduate school at Yale where we had a class of 30 um, students in the PhD program, two women and 28 men. Uh, then I went back to a, the previous all-male institution. So I think it can happen in either way. I, I do think that some of the data that's out there now, you have to be a little careful about because the people who are of an age to be in leadership positions, the, the schools from which they could choose were, were very different than they are now. Right. So I think you'd have to worry about cohort effects. And, yeah. and any work you did on See, that. I didn't realize you had that same experience, so I too went to a single sex institution that was male. And, and I think really? that has been a tremendously, um, tremendously helpful uh, in taking leadership positions and yeah. so forth because for what you just said, typically we're in a room that's, uh, or a group or a gathering that's mainly male. And to have been kind of socialized in that way, I think was tremendously valuable. I, on the other hand, could not have attended the University of Virginia because it didn't admit women at the time I graduated from right. high school. So I now lead a school that is now half women, half men, but for many years was male only. So I, I'm the president that leads an <laughs> all-women's college. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> As you can imagine, I'm a big believer in all women's education. <laughs> but I think there's, I, I would, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, um, statistics out there that would suggest that women who graduate from um, all women's colleges um, uh, are disproportionately represented in many kinds of uh, things like Forbes 500. And but the one point that I would really make that I think that is worth making, and as a study done by Tom Check when he was uh, the head of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute was that if you look at scientists, so I'm a scientist, so I like to think about this from the science point of view, that clearly uh, women uh, leaders in science, so those professors that are actually out at research universities, are disproportionately educated in liberal arts colleges and in women's colleges in particular. So it's very interesting to see that if you look at the women professors, um, many of them went uh, to uh, to women's colleges, and if you look at professors in general, they went to liberal arts colleges and um, and and uh, and um, women's colleges. I think there's something to be said about that that I think is very important, which is the kinds of education that a small college can provide. 
um, allows, I think, very close contact between a budding scientist and a professor in a way that a university has a difficult time doing. Um, that's not to say the university doesn't train great scientists going out there because graduate school is where most of these people will end up in a large and, and successful research enterprise at a university. But I think there's a really special place, I think, for women's colleges and liberal arts colleges in um, providing that sort of special education that leads to leadership positions, particularly in science. You all have different uh, concentrations. Um, we have a scientist here. We have a sociologist. We have, help me, so scientist. We have a, 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 an economist. And we have uh, s s one of the classics, classics. my mm -hmm. favorite, Greek tragedy and what else? Um, <laughs> something equally. Fascinating. It's Roman ethics. Roman ethics. <laughs> In relation to your areas of research, um, it, it, was it easier or more difficult based on your concentration? I, I always mention Larry Summers. I hope he's not in the audience um, <laughs> with his statement about women in science and math. But uh, is there any difference? Is there any? You know, you. I think all but one of you came up at starting at faculty and just wending your way through the system. Um, was there a difference? Were you picked on more often because of your concentration? Did that play into it at all, as far as where you and how, what kind of research you were doing? Well, I would say that um, if I had to describe the one thing that really has uh, helped me and enhanced my leadership ability, it's really being a scientist. I think being a scientist is great leadership training. I, I must say this. Um, and let me tell you why. So if you think about it, you know, when you're an undergraduate um, and you're majoring in science, it's pretty much all about you and your learning and your growing up. Um, ultimately, a person who's going to be a scientist will go to graduate school and do a postdoctoral fellowship. And what you find as you're being educated in science is that science is a very collaborative field. In other words, as, as a graduate student, you are a part of a team. You have a mentor, and that mentor has a team. And eventually, when I became an assistant professor on the faculty, that's how it was for me as well. I led a lab, a team of about 16 people. There were postdoctoral fellows. There were graduate students. There were undergraduates. There were some visiting physicians and, and technicians. But there was a team of people who all weighed in on the sort of important problems that this, my laboratory was uh, was uh, directing research towards at the time. And that team approach, that collaborative approach, where you really deliberate over data, you make decisions based on that, you can change your mind based on that, really leads to this wonderful way of solving problems and moving your research agenda ahead. And so I think that this sort of you know, listening and learning and, and working together is a wonderful way to start thinking about how to sort of manage your own leadership skills in a way, because it's such a powerful way to do it. So I'll, I'll put a plug in for being an economist. And, <laughs> I knew it. And I hope, yeah, I hope everybody puts a plug in. And, for <laughs> and, it, and, and it's not that you know how to manage the endowment, because if I knew how to do that, I wouldn't be be yeah. president of an academic institution. I'd be making money some other way. Um, and it's, it's not that I can balance a budget or enjoy making budget cuts. Uh, I, for any of you who have studied economics, it's, it's the, the notion that we often think about um, how to think about utility or a utility function and maximize some objective sub subject to constraints. And in many ways, that's what we do day in and day out managing uh, an institution of higher education. We think about incentives to, to, as a way of getting people to do things, which turns out to be very important. Uh, and we think about trade-offs. So that's my little plug for economics. So I'm a demographer. <laughs> about 60% of all demographers are sociologists. About 30% are economists. Uh, about 10% are geographers and political scientists and anthropologists. And the great thing about demography is what an interdisciplinary field it is. Um, being open to other disciplines is immensely important in going into academic administration. And demography gave me a natural opportunity to interact with lots of people from other fields. It also was just helpful. So I got called on by the administration at my universities to 
you know, give them advice, you know, talk about how many 18-year-olds would be coming up to graduation over the next five to ten years, and I could actually do projections of things like that, and that was, that was very helpful. Um, so actually, the subject matter of demography has proven helpful, partly because of the analytic tools that it gives you, um, partly because it teaches you to be evidence-based, which is another important thing in management. It's much better to make your decisions based on data uh, than based on something else. Um, of course, I feel the same way as my colleagues. I think being a classicist is the perfect. <laughs> 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 now, this one is a little more obscure. Actually, the, uh, the Teagle Foundation about five years ago did a, had a very interesting gathering where they brought together a, a fairly large number of college presidents. And one of the things they, it was a sort of a round table. And one of the things that they asked us about was the importance of our discipline, our disciplinary study. Uh, to leadership style and what we did. And every one of us was convinced that seeing the world through the frame of his or her discipline was just crucial. You know, and I think that is something that comes from our training. Now, it might be a little less obvious why ancient Greek would be helpful as opposed to <laughs> economics <laughs> or demography. Um, and there are many ways in which it is. And as I said, also, uh, understanding the Roman Empire and why it fell is also helpful. <laughs> 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 but I think the major one is, and I'm quite serious about it, every day I think as a classicist, and I'll bet each one of us thinks that every day our training influences how, how, what we do and how we do it and so forth. I honestly think one of the great um, advantages for me is being a classicist, you literally do think in terms of thousands of years. And some days, especially with, given whatever crosses your desk, it's very helpful to think <laughs> this too shall pass. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very broad-based <laughs> group here. I have a two-part question, and you can jump in at any part you like. How did you learn to lead? This is one of my favorite questions. Some of you touched on it before. How did you learn to lead? What, did, were you born that way? Did you find it coming up, you know, coming up through the ranks that you were becoming a leader of, I would say men, but that would be ridiculous, that you were becoming a leader? And what is your leadership style? There is a whole, as we all know, that um, the, uh, the whole body of literature on men leading like women, uh, men leading like men, women leading like women, and then the groups interchange, the soft and fuzzy, the hard and practical. So how do you lead and how do you learn it? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I would say my leadership, I'm going to start with the leadership style. Um, I would say, and this won't be surprising given what I just told you about uh, sort of the laboratory setting being an important part of my development of my leadership skills, is that I'm a listener. Uh, and that's a very important part of my leadership style. Uh, I like to listen to what people have to say. I like to have around me people with different ideas. Um, I like to ask a lot of questions. Um, I have a lot of ideas of my own, but I also appreciate that other people have also have ideas. and so. Being able to listen to ideas, to be able to synthesize them, to bring them together into something that might be a little different than everybody's idea, but it's sort of a new idea, uh, then to question that idea and have other people weigh in on that idea is pretty much the way I do business. It doesn't mean that you spend all of your time doing this, because it might sound like, you know, how do you ever get anything done? Um, at some point in time, you need to be decisive, um, and I think that for me, that, that really uh, is based very much, and I think uh, uh, Cappy and I are similar in that way. I'm a very um, data-driven person. I like to accumulate not only the ideas uh, and um, put them together, but to really say, well, what do we know about this? What's been done in the past about this? What has the institution, you know, how many other committees have thought about this? Uh, really bring together all the information that relates to the particular thing that you're you're interested in, and then use that as a part of your decision making. And that's how I would describe my decision making. And I'll comment just briefly on, on um, learning. And I think for me, it was really by watching other people. And I, it, it, that could be positive and negative. You could watch somebody, <laughs> yes. and, and I didn't even really think I knew that I was doing it at the time, but you watch somebody 
run a committee and you go, ooh, that's, that was like a really bad way to do yes. that. <laughs> and, and you think a little bit about why that was and maybe it was because they weren't using data or they weren't listening. Um, so, so in some ways I think I've absorbed it just by being involved in an institution and coming up through the ranks and watching other people do it and deciding for myself what was going to be most effective given my past experience. What I find works for me is having a leadership team in which people are different from each other and different from me. I really do believe, and there's good experimental data to back this up, that more diverse groups make better and more creative decisions. And I also try to create an atmosphere in which it's okay to make a mistake so that people will feel free to tell me about what's really going on. A big problem in organizations, and the larger the organization is, the more this is an issue, is that bad news does not travel up very That's well. Right. <laughs> and so you've got to let people know that if they bring you bad news, you're not going to shoot the messenger. So the institution must be too small. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, people have learned from a more punitive style that if they tell you something bad, something bad will happen to them. So you've got to free people up to be able to give you the bad news. Um, but I also think listening is very important. And if you've read Deborah Tanner, you know that men interrupt women a lot. <laughs> so it's very helpful to be able to summarize a conversation succinctly so that you have the sound bite at the end of the conversation. Excellent point. <laughs> um, I'll take this in a slightly different direction. You asked about um, how does one, how do we learn to become leaders or something? And I don't know that I could answer that looking back in my past and what affected me or whatever. But there is an interesting um, sort of factoid that I've reflected on a little bit. And, and I think it actually influences our perceptions today to some extent of women college presidents. Uh, and, and that is, you know, we, we talk about the glass ceiling across all kinds of sectors and industries. In higher education, I think we have something that I would call the starry imperium. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is when the presidents of Harvard, Brown, Penn, you know, <laughs> we go on, are, are women, that's very visible and I think it gives a mistaken impression of the progress that women have made in higher education. Now the factoid to which I allude to is that interestingly, um, Ruth Simmons, the president of Brown, Amy Gutman, the president of Penn, of course, Shirley Tillman, the president of Princeton, I, um, were all at Princeton when Harold Shapiro was the president. And we've talked about this a little bit, and I think none of us would say that he was a mentor, because um, that wasn't the way he operated. But I think all of us um, benefited from his leadership. He was someone who just, as a leader, had confidence that you were capable and just kind of gave us the, the possibility of doing more and going farther. And so I've looked back on that in my own role now and tried to, to kind of emulate that. That's, that's very interesting because I remember a president at City University of New York who worked at one of the community college. I would say that he worked with about seven women who are now college presidents, everybody who worked with this wonderful, I think his name was Joseph Schenker. Um, he, everybody, and I, I think he probably was half a mentor. I think that, that he appreciated the fact that w the women worked very hard. Um, and I think they are now all doctorally trained and they are now all presidents, uh, many of them of CUNY colleges. So he's, he's the mentor that always sticks in my mind and why wasn't he around a lot longer to help all the rest of us <laughs> who were struggling. But I think there are people, I think there are, um, since men represent most of the college presidents, when we are, we are coming up through the ranks, that's who we're, you know, we're usually looking at a man to work with us, to mentor us, which leads me right into our next topic, which are resources. We're going to go to resources, and then we're going to go to obstacles. So the first one is, what did you use? What did you utilize that, again, that worked, that helped? Mentors is obviously a biggie, um, and then other types of resources that, that helped move you forward. Money. Money. <laughs> you need to be on the committees 
that either make policy about money or actually distribute money. So, you know, if that means getting on an NSF panel where you are in an advisory role about proposals, or if it means sitting on a committee at your college that makes decisions about scholarships, those are the committees that really matter. And the one thing you must be able to do in administration, regardless of what else you do, is to be able to keep the budget balanced and to know enough about the money that you're comfortable in those discussions. I'll put in a, what unfortunately will be kind of a plug. Um, um, when I, I alluded to going from the professoriate to moving into an administrative role, and basically as soon as I did that, I realized, well, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, and so there is a program which uh, has been holding uh, professional development sessions for women in higher education for, I think we've had our 30th, no, we have our 40th anniversary coming up. Uh, it's called HERS, which mm. stands for Higher Education Resource Services. And um, for 40 years, it has been holding programs on Kim's campus, um, Wellesley, the Bryn Mawr campus, and now uh, Denver University. And it's a wonderful boot camp that tries to, um, typically uh, faculty chairs, women who are in mid-level administrative positions in colleges and universities, and tries to train them across all the different fields of, um, that are involved in university management, like finance. Uh, and so that was the first thing I did. And then um, I think probably most of us, and think, I think a couple of you were in the group that I taught, um, I think many of us go to the Harvard uh, programs for new presidents when we're actually appointed to a presidency, another fantastic program. Yeah, you know, that's, it's really an interesting question because I look at it from my point of view and I guess of the generation that, you know, there weren't the HERS type programs, there wasn't leadership training, uh, no one really thought about these things in many ways and even mentoring was very uh, complicated to sort of figure out for yourself um, and something I think that's really, really important and I think that if I look back in my life as to what, what really, uh, what helped me, uh, what you know, sort of people uh, and situations helped me, I'd have to say that, um, you know, to some extent it was, if, if I just started with undergraduate for a moment, and I think there were sort of good moments and bad moments when I was an undergraduate. And the good moments were I had a professor who just really inspired me. Um, and uh, that led for, to me, for me, that was just really, you know, believed in me, thought I was doing great things, and that, that, that's, that's such an important thing to happen to a student as an undergraduate. I also had a professor who, um, you know, this was in the, in the 60s, and uh, who was my chemistry professor, and every time I came into class, we were all, you know, we all sat in alphabetical order. And I was usually late because my class, other class before was pretty far away who would always point out that I was wearing slacks to class, and this really wasn't appropriate. And this happened about three times a week. And so you think, you know, how does an undergraduate react to a professor making that kind of comment? And the sort of, it's, I think, one of those things that was an important moment for me because I thought he was ridiculous. And so, <laughs> I mean, that was literally, I thought he was ridiculous. And so that was an important thing for me to think and to, and to recognize. Um, go, went on to graduate school and had a fabulous mentor as, a, um, as my graduate advisor. I was later to find out, uh, much later, that he was actually the only person in the department, because it, it was a faculty of all men, men, who was willing to take a woman graduate student. Yes. Um, so that's a kind of, a kind of an outrageous statement these days, but in fact was the case. And it was clear that he took women graduate students because he believed that women could do the work. And that belief translated into being a really great mentor for women at a time when women didn't have a whole lot of uh, mentoring. And then finally, I think one of the things that I think really was uh, uh, really key for me in terms of just sort of persisting and, and I think helped in, in really formulating my leadership ability was I worked at the National Institutes of Health uh, mm -hmm. as a postdoctoral fellow. And uh, I worked uh, in a laboratory of uh, many people uh, who were all really great scientists in the field of immunology, which is my field. And the thing that they did is they uh, had very high standards. And um, they um, really uh, uh, created an atmosphere 
where they had great expectations of me. So they, what I call, didn't cut me any slack just because I was a woman. Um, and because of that, I left there feeling like I can go out and really be a scientist and hold my own in almost any situation because I came out of this environment, which was a pretty tough environment, but yet very rewarding for me. So I think all of those kinds of experiences lead up to your ability ultimately to be a good leader. I would just add, as you start out on whatever you're doing, um, try to put yourself in the position where you're, where you're being challenged. If things aren't being offered to you, opportunities to serve on a committee that looks like it's interesting, go out and, and search them, search for them, and, and say no to ones that you think are pushing you in a direction that you don't want to go. I think that's really, really important. So, you know, be, yeah. be on, the, on the finance committee, mm -hmm. don't be on the, this is going to sound awful, but the child care committee. You may, that may be very important, you may <laughs> want to do it, but make sure you've got mm. these other things as well. And then when you're in those positions, um, look for people who you can seek uh, advice and counsel from, people that you respect and, and people who will take the time to help you do what you're doing, doing well. But I, I do think you have, to be able, you have to be willing to take on those things and be slightly um, risk-seeking in a way so that you get these opportunities and then learn from them. That's such a great point because it, when you're a, a woman, a young woman in ac academia, you're, because women are still not as well represented in academia uh, as they should be, um, you're asked to sit on a lot of committees, a lot of committees, because they want women to be on these committees. So in fact, you can be quite busy all of the time. Um, and so at some point in time, you have to be very strategic and just say no. Um, and say, I don't want to be on this committee. I'd prefer to be on that committee. And just saying no is actually very hard, but it's something that I think it's important for, for people to do. Yeah. You've made it sound easy. Were there any obstacles? Or am I sitting in the room with the presidents who made it to the top <laughs> the best way possible? What, do, you, do you remember uh, any obstacles along the way? <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, there are too many to remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to start. I think a couple of years ago there was, um, well, I'm sure all of you experience this, about every year there's a graduate student somewhere who wants to do a study of women presidents. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and so every once in a while, you know, I participate in these things. <laughs> and um, so in recent years I've probably participated in a, a couple of those where the person identifies, who knows, a dozen, two dozen women presidents and tries to um, understand something about them and so forth. And one of the things that I think is very striking is that um, I think pretty much universally uh, that the women who are asked that question will hesitate just as we did. That is, we know there are obstacles, but I think there's something about our personalities that chooses not to focus on them. And, and actually kind of, yeah. yeah, on the one hand we can say, oh, there were a zillion. You know, the time when I was a faculty member at Brown and they asked me to take the minutes at the meetings. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know there were a zillion, but you just pass them by, you just move on. And, and I think if you are going to, um, to move forward in this kind of, and, and come into this kind of position, you can't be someone who dwells on those. You know they're there, but you just move on. You know, it, I, I mentioned the story about how I had a graduate student advisor who was the only one in the department who um, took women. And I think the kind of interesting part of that story, which is sort of tells a story in myself, was that I didn't know that at the time. And I found out many, many years later, it was about five or six years ago, when that graduate advisor invited um, uh, several of his uh, uh, former graduate students to come to have a reunion in New York City. And we were, we were, there were four women. And all the four women have had really wonderful science careers, so it's really a tribute to him. And as we were sitting having martinis one night, um, <laughs> one of the women said, you know, I just can't believe that, uh, you know, he was the only woman, the only person in the department who didn't, uh, who took women. And I was shocked by that statement. And I thought, what does that say about me that I didn't know this all this time? And I, 
And I think what it says about me is that, that I just didn't notice, you know, that I was very kind of single-minded about what I did and that I couldn't, as you pointed out, lots of things happen all the time, and particularly to women in science. You could spend your whole life every day responding to those things, and you will respond to some of those things if they're important enough to you, but to some extent, you just, you have to say, I'm not going to notice everything, and I'm gonna move on with what I think are the important things to me. I think this would be a good point in our discussion to talk about changes in the academy. We've talked about uh, women in increasing numbers. I think in 86, 9% of college presidents were women. We're now talking about 23% of women. We've discussed the fact that we'd like to increase that number um, so that perhaps 50% and 50% wouldn't seem so unusual and um, that the model of a college president is not a white, middle-aged, graying, gray-haired male. That somebody walking in and saying, I'm the president, would just be the president. Um, has the academy changed? Has academe changed since early Greece and Rome? <laughs> um, no. Have women coming up through the ranks, have women as faculty members, Women, I know my pet peeve is women making coffee um, instead of taking minutes, but women's changing roles <coughs> in the academy, this is why we're all here. What has changed in the academy? What is changing in the academy so that young women who aspire to be on the faculty um, know where to go um, and so that in 10 years, 40% of college presidents are women. After all, we have a graying society. There will be places for young women um, to, to go. I mean, is that where we're headed? Um, has the academy itself changed? Having women in the academy in larger numbers, has that changed the academy? Um, where, where are we going? What, in what direction do you see us headed? Well, the median age of college presidents right now is 61. There's a demographer's factoid for you. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you, if you look at that cohort, the, the 60s age cohort of professors, women were still relatively scarce in that age group. They're going to be more numerous as we go on. But there's some recent trends that actually bother me quite a lot. So something over 50% of all the biology PhDs in the United States, the newly minted PhDs, are women and yet under 20% of them yeah. uh, are going into tenure track positions. Right. And now when you ask women graduate students in the sciences if they want to be professors, they say no. Now that's very serious because it may mean that women choose not to come into the academy and choose not to be faculty members. And then we really won't make any progress. It's true the pipeline, I think, is the usual pipeline for a presidency is through the faculty ranks. So if we want to have a robust pipeline for women presidents, um, there have to be women in the faculty ranks to, to, to mm -hmm. be able to do that. And so um, I think there's been progress. There's, I think, no doubt about there's been progress. I think if we look at, my, I would guess, most of the social sciences and the humanities, uh, women are well represented um, or reasonably represented in faculty ranks, uh, much more complicated in the sciences, um, but progress has been made. Um, but there's still, op even with that, um, there's still obstacles. I think you still need to have those presidents or those provosts who are looking out and seeing where are the, the stars, where are the people with talent, uh, and looking broadly, looking at um, those folks coming through the faculty that are women, that are minorities, that have talent uh, to help, you know, help develop that in a way. I think that's, it's going to take an active process as well as the passive one of just having the numbers there. I think things have gotten better. If I look back to when I started as a faculty member and some of the women who had arrived, both my experience compared to people who arrived 10 or 20 years later, as well as people who were 10 years ahead of me, I think things have improved, but I think they have to get significantly better. Um, th these are wonderful but challenging jobs, and uh, women are going into the academy at a time that is complicated for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we've addressed it with significantly better chi child care, uh, stopping the tenure clock if you do choose to have a child, 
Uh, I think it's much more likely now that both in a family situation, both spouses will be helping out in a way that wasn't the case before. But I, I still think an awful lot of burden in, in situations where women are choosing to have families still put an awful lot of burden on the women. And uh, that's something that our institutions, I think, are sensitive to and trying to address. But it's, I don't think we've got it completely solved yet. Not yet. Yeah. But we're on our way. So I think that at this point, um, if you want to, op unless we have something to add, do you want to open it up to questions? Or? And if you want to ask a question, <coughs> I think you have to go to the microphones. Oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> it's really hard to see. <laughs> okay, we have one over here. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Angela. I'm currently at the George Washington University, but I was at the University of Michigan for my graduate work. Um, I have a question about transitions. Um, as all of you have experience at various institutions that have a variety of cultures and priorities, um, what advice do you have for people um, or what have you learned navigating transitions from one institution to another um, and how do you leverage um, that change to continue to build upon your professional identity and your professional goals? Yeah, that's a very perceptive question, actually, because I think each of us could have come, sort of made that transition from one kind of institution to another, and that, that's a really uh, a key factor. I came from Yale, so it was a research university and went to uh, a small liberal arts college for women. Um, and I recognized right away that I'm, and I should back up and just say that one of the great things about the United States is it has a lot of colleges and universities that very much have their own mission, that it's based on a tremendous history. So there's a lot of variety and, and sort of personalities to colleges and universities that, uh, that are available, I think, to students. But when you're a president moving from one institution to another, you really have to be aware of what the history is and what the culture of the place is. And so for me, uh, just a couple of the things that I did is I just spent a lot of time listening, um, going around and talking to each of the constituencies separately to find out what did they think, what was important to them. Um, I'm still actually doing that. I started out uh, a program called Faculty Wine Receptions where I invited 10 to 13 faculty members to my house and we would drink a good bottle of wine and we would talk about things. And I used that as a moment where I'd say, I have an idea. And, uh, and listen to what their ideas were and what their reaction to my ideas were. And you learn so much about an institution based on that kind of listening moment. And I think all presidents probably have to spend a lot of time listening to begin with. Hello. Hello. Thank you to you all for your time. Um, my name is Fatima, graduate of Wellesley College. <laughs> um, <laughs> there you all are. <laughs> and my question is for the entire panel. What role did your life outside of academia, your support system, your family play in your career trajectory <coughs> as well as your current accomplishments? Do you have a life outside your job? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good thing. It's okay. um, I think I think one of the things that, that you do do is all of those things come together and they have to be part of the whole that is what's eating up all your time. So um, I am somebody with a spouse and three kids and uh, they their, their life and my life was very intertwined with the institution because of the amount of time that, that you do spend working. But, but I do think that um, I certainly get much of my pleasure and satisfaction, certainly from my family, but I wouldn't say that I have much of a private life outside of my, my, my job. My friends and my kids' friends are all part of the world that I'm in. I would second that. I, I didn't make clear when I mentioned about the HERS organization before. I'm the chair of that board. And we discovered this more and more talking to women presidents that they say, forget balance. There is no balance between things. There must be a holistic kind of intertwining. And, yeah. and I think people are happier thinking about it that way. Yeah. 
there are also stages of your life. So I didn't really consider moving into central administration until my children had left home. And the empty nest proved to be a very compatible time for that. But it also helped that I have a husband who's always been very supportive, was a true co-parent with me, which allowed me to have a good academic career before I went into administration. Yeah, and I would agree with all those things. Uh, it's very hard, I think, for a president to have sort of an outside of the presidency life. Um, uh, what, and, and I think that it's probably what you all don't realize is that actually presidency is a kind of a lonely job. You, you can't be best friends with the people that uh, are at your institution. Um, and so if you're in a different location than the one you've been working in before, um, it's hard to establish kind of friendships out of the sort of the normal, uh, what, like you would normally do if you weren't a president. Um, so that's a complicated thing, and that's why groups of presidents being able to get together in a variety of ways to be able to go to this new president's um, you know, education uh, uh, at Harvard uh, helps all of those kinds of things. What I would say, though, just to second it, is that um, having a supportive and understanding partner is really huge. Yeah. Can I just jump in here real quickly? You think it's the same for male presidents? Yeah, I think so. You think? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? yeah. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Next? I already forgot which way are we going. <laughs> Hi, my name is Laura Gerke, and I just graduated from Kenyon College, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have a really simple question for all of you. What's your favorite part about what you do day to day? Just what are those moments that give you that satisfaction? Um, what do you enjoy most? Well, I'll pick up Laura since <laughs> uh, we were talking about this a little bit before, actually. Uh, I do think that many of us actually enjoy the fact that it's unpredictable, that you never know what's going to happen. And sometimes that's terrible, but sometimes it's wonderful. Um, aside from that, I'd say I think um, for me, the happiest moments are just when you've, when you've solved a problem, when you've really made something better for a student or a faculty member or you know, tangibly bettered the college in some way. I, I was going to say the same thing. When, some, when something goes well and you've actually uh, solved a problem, it, it feels good. Yeah. Since I'm a pretty new president, for me it's still really a thrill when I walk from my house to my office and I intersect a lot of students going to class and we stop and talk. I really, I really enjoy that. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Barbara Coward. I'm a proud Vassar alumna. Right. <laughs> and I also spent a wonderful cool. semester at Wellesley as an exchange student. So it's great to see you guys. <laughs> I work for the Selinger School of Business at Loyola University, Maryland in Baltimore. And as a footnote, uh, it's kind of a neat uh, thing. All of our uh, leadership in our business school, our dean, associate dean, and assistant dean are all female. When you think about the percentage of students in an MBA program, 80% uh, and above are male, it, it's kind of neat uh, for that. My question for you, and I'm so glad you asked, raised the question about leadership development, because that's something that we're talking about every day. How do you, when you're in academia, either an administrative side like I am or on the faculty side, and you're trying to bring change and innovate, you often need to influence other people. So I'm curious to hear your story, success tips on how you influenced others. Thank you. You know, I, I think, so she's the Vassar, I have to take this one, right? That, that seems to be how this is working. So I'll, I'll mumble a little bit here. Um, Certainly, my way of dealing with everybody that I work with is, is to give them lots of responsibility and let them run with things, but in a, in a collaborative way so that we're often talking in a group about where we'd like to go and how it would fit in with what we're trying to do with the institution quite broadly. So it's, it's, um, it's really giving people freedom but some, some guidance and then letting them figure out that, that they can succeed by running with that. So I don't know, it's not, I guess it's the best I can do. <laughs> we do occasional post-mortems when something, some event has happened and then I convene people and we sit down and I say, well, how did that go? Could we have done that better? You know, what, what went well? What didn't go so well? What could we do differently next time? And, and then it's an opportunity to you know, point out some bigger issues and, and places where we can develop. 
And I also uh, will be asking my staff as they prepare their goals for next year to include a developmental goal for themselves along with their other goals. I would relate this to what we said earlier about um, listening, which sounds kind of counterintuitive because I think we often think of influence as telling. But particularly on many of our kinds of campuses, it may be a little different on a larger campus. Uh, I think the most powerful tool for influencing is actually listening and understanding the other person and the institution. And there's actually been some very interesting um, doctoral work that's come out of the Harvard Grad School of Education about this, that for presidents certainly to influence a college, the only way that that turns out to be possible is for the members of the college to feel that you're one of them, you understand them, you share their values, and so forth. I think it's very important to be really actually actively solicit ideas. So as I started my presidency, we set up an academic planning committee to really look at where does the institution want to be in the next five to ten years? And a lot of terrific ideas from the faculty came out of that um, uh, planning uh, uh, activity that we are now you know, talking about, thinking about, kind of redesigning a bit, uh, very exciting things. And I think partnering with them and making uh, them be able to realize their own aspirations uh, is a really rewarding thing for a president. Hi, my name is Sally Carroll, and I am the mother of two Kenyan graduates. Hi, President Nugent, Hello. one of whom has just asked your question, Laura. And uh, I heard a lot about mentoring uh, in this discussion. Do any of you have any formal mentoring programs for the women coming up through the pipeline? And if you don't, should there be? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm wrestling with the word formal. Um, I think, I mean, we do in fact have formal mentoring programs for faculty members, uh, but not formalized for other roles in, in the college. And I guess I'd say, if, if I uh, allude back to what I said before about someone that I think was very influential in my life and yet neither I nor he would have defined it as a formal mentoring role. Mm -hmm. I guess my prejudice in that regard is that I think a lot of the most successful of those kinds of relationships are not formal, mm -hmm. but develop somehow organically from a relationship. We do have a formal leadership program mm -hmm. to which um, younger faculty and staff can be uh, nominated. It was originally designed to be for women. Now there are uh, some men in it as well. It's, um, it, it's a semester-long program. Um, every Monday is devoted to it for most of a semester. The, the participants have projects they undertake. They interview senior leadership and talk about the various roles they fill. So I would say it's more leadership than mentoring, but certainly I think some people develop a mentor as a result of it. Don't, don't wait for formal opportunities. I, I think one of the real lessons is that uh, seek people out, mm -hmm. and, and most people are very willing to help and talk to you. Not everybody, but, but many people, but may not take the initiative. And so find people who, they, who you respect what they're doing and talk to them about what they're doing, and I think you can establish relationships that will serve you very well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm a Vassar grad as well. Uh, <laughs> Hey, Vassar. Um, I actually had a question about the student body. Um, a lot of your campuses, Wellesley obviously is all women, but um, are heavily female, um, biasing towards women now as more and more women are going to college instead of men. We've talked about this. But the student body leadership continues to be men at all of these schools. And I mean, it was true at Vassar, and you know, the women stay at the, the second or third tier leadership. They stay at the club level. They don't get involved with the administration as much. What are you doing as women leaders of colleges to help foster women leaders in your student body? Because eventually those women, one would hope, would be the ones going into faculty, becoming the presidents of the next generation of colleges. Well, this may be an exception, but I actually see a lot of women in leadership at UVA. 
And in fact, we have one alumna here who was a student member of the Board of Visitors. The Board of Visitors picks one student a year, and you know, very often it's a woman student. Uh, but I also see women leading lots of other things on grounds, including, very importantly, our Honor Council. And um, I, think that, I think it starts in the first year uh, when I see women in leadership in their residence halls and all sorts of other things, and then it becomes a habit, and then you expect to be a leader by the time you're a fourth year. The um, president of the VSA last year was a woman. Yeah, uh, after a long debate there about was <clears throat> women never being president of the VSA. I mean, I guess the problem that I'm talking about isn't so much the residence halls or the clubs. Mm -hmm. It's the people who actually engage with the administration, the people in the kind of uh, higher, <coughs> higher level of, of college campus leadership. The, I mean, VSA president one year was a woman, but mm -hmm. every year before that was a man. Um, the you know, people who are on who are represented the board of trustees are often w men. That is kind of what I'm talking about. You see a lot of women doing residential being RAs. You don't see a lot of women going into the president job. It's actually really interesting because, uh, of course, I'm you know at Wellesley. All the women hold the leadership positions. It's one of the great things about a women's college. You know, we really invest in women and women's leadership. But there was an interesting uh, article or, um, that's come out recently uh, that reports on a study just done at Princeton. And Princeton made a huge um, gain in terms of uh, women in leadership positions in the 60s and 70s. But um, recently, when they've studied, you know, are women in leadership positions, they find that they aren't as much anymore. It's sort of a 60-40. And they're really interested in figuring out, well, why is that the case? And so the question is, it'd really be nice to study the schools where women are persisting and are in uh, leadership positions versus those that aren't at a time when women are the majority of the students and finding out what is it that's really responsible for this. I think we're going to see a lot more <coughs> attention to this question because of that study which has gotten a lot of press mm -hmm. and it's unclear how, how universal that phenomenon is. Yeah. I mean, I would say the same thing about my college. I don't know, Laura? Got, it, it, lots of women in leadership, right? I, I, don't, I don't think there is an imbalance there. So it's going to be interesting as, as I think colleges are going to be urged to look at this question more carefully and maybe we'll see patterns. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Guy Lopez. I'm, I, went, I graduated from the University of Virginia two years ago with a master's degree. And I'm a, I have a lot of school spirit, I would say. <laughs> yeah, so welcome, President Sullivan and all the other presidents. It's really an honor. Um, you're really needed there at the University of Virginia. Um, but my question is, um, now that you've arrived in leadership as women, um, you know, there's still a, a lot of injustice you know, in the institution um, to be addressed. And how easy is it to be comfortable at this point? Or, I don't know, like speaking as an American Indian, I'm a federally recognized American Indian, uh, the University of Virginia, in all of its history, I don't know if there's ever been a tenured American Indian professor. There are virtually no American Indian programs and there really, right now, is no plan to change it. There's no study being conducted to assess that issue. And it, it's like, as an American Indian, you know, a, a citizen of an Indian tribe, an, an Indian nation, we're virtually non-existent in terms of the University of Virginia's presentation of our reality. You know, the world, the country that we live in, you know, we're we have no office at the University of Virginia. And I went to school there, and I consistently asked for steps to be taken. And nothing, you know, we haven't gained any traction. And I think, so I'm wondering, how easy would it be to just ignore the, the whole idea that, uh, say, Native American women should be on the faculty of your college or university? You know, institutions really don't ignore these things, particularly uh, uh, academic institutions. It's something we think about actively all the time. It's really hard work. 
One of the things I did when I was at Yale is that I was a deputy provost for science, technology, and faculty development. And one of the things there I did was to start up a diversity um, a program to think about hiring a more diverse faculty because we felt that was very important for the education of our students. It was a, it was a basic principle of the institution. Um, but with all of these things, you have to ask when you do each individual search, what is the pipeline of graduate students that are available um, for any particular group oh, yeah. identity that could fill that faculty position. And I think that's a good exercise because if you find in, you're hiring in sociology and you would love to have a more diverse faculty and the pipeline is rich there, you can then say to the department, it's good to have a, an applicant pool that represents what the pipeline looks at. If you're talking to a department and the applicant pool is pretty thin there, then it's a different conversation. But I think using that kind of data-driven approach, which is, means that we're thinking about it all the time relative to all searches that we run is exactly what we all do. And I think it you know, ultimately will lead to success, even though it doesn't feel like it's moving very fast to you. I think one of our particular problems has been that the recession has so slowed down the rate at which any of us can hire faculty these days that there are almost no searches underway. So, um, you know, if the economy turns up and we can once again begin to do searches, I think diversifying faculty would be a very important objective for everybody. Um, and, you know, that includes making sure that the faculty who form the search committee have had the appropriate training so that their implicit biases get revealed and dealt with appropriately in the course of the committee deliberation. But when you don't ha even have any search committees because there's no funding to do the search, it's less of an issue. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Corbin Campbell. I'm a UVA alum, and uh, I'm also a doctoral student who studies women academics. So you can imagine this panel was <laughs> right up my alley. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, one of the things that was really amazing for me to hear as you were speaking was the incredible amount of agency that each of you had in uh, seemingly throughout your career. And uh, I'm, I'm, you talked a little bit about mentors, some other individual things that might have helped you to exert that agency. But what I'm interested in is whether there were any specific organizational climates or environments that you felt um, helped to facilitate that agency for you. So ones that were you know, maybe more transparent or more competitive or um, what, type, what types of environments um, helped you in that way? That's a really good question. Um, so, you know, unlike some of the other people here, I've always been in a big research-oriented organization. And I think that the, um, the problem there for a lot of faculty members is that they get locked down into what might actually be a fairly large department. But they don't meet people in other fields, uh, you know, they don't meet people in other research areas. They get more and more specialized in what they do, which could be terrific for your career as an academic, it won't make you a good administrator. So I think one of the things that helped me was that I worked in research organizations that had a kind of a matrix organization where you were expected to be an active member of a department, but were also encouraged to be an active member of a research group. And those weren't necessarily the same people. And I found that as my circles of just acquaintances at the university widened, so did my institutional knowledge so did my opportunity to become aware of what else was going on. And then other people could also find me. Uh, whereas if you just stay in your own department for 20, 25 years, that can get to be kind of boring, actually, uh, and certainly kind of stultifying. I was at an institution that had been formerly all men and then admitted women. And uh, as a faculty member, I think just being there at that point in time was actually quite helpful because they, they realized that they needed to have women who could be mentors for students and examples for students. And I, I think that probably gave me some opportunities to get involved in things that might not have happened otherwise. Y you run into a little bit of the problem that, that Kim mentioned, which is that you got asked to do everything and at some point you had to make sure you were getting done what you really needed to do and not doing the stuff that, that was gonna not be helpful for what you wanted to accomplish. Yeah, I find your question very interesting too and for a different reason, I think. And this is where being a classicist comes in again. Um, I mean, not only am I, an, I'm not even a historian, God help us, I'm a literary scholar. So, 
it strikes me, it's very interesting that you picked that up about agency. And I would actually relate it to the way, obviously, each of us constructs a narrative of our lives. And we've probably, I mean, again, looking at personality, that we've probably emphasized agency rather than helplessness. You know? <laughs> and, and we construct things in that way. Judy. Um, I'm, I'm Judy Hallett, and <laughs> I am a Wellesley College graduate, and a former Blagan visiting scholar at Vassar, and a classics professor at University of Maryland at College of Art, and a colleague okay. of Georgia's. At Virginia? Ever? No. <laughs> yes, but my question is about STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics, is that what it stands for? And I'd like specifically to address it to Teresa, if the rest of you don't mind. My university, University of Maryland at College Park, and it's had engineers in its leadership, so this is maybe an important factor here, is putting a huge emphasis on STEM at the expense of liberal arts, and it often involves a disparagement of selective liberal arts institutions and of women. For example, even in my college, which is the Humanities College, we are not allowed to choose reviewers for tenure and promotion cases from liberal arts colleges. They don't count. If a PhD from my college gets a position at a liberal arts college, such as Mount Holyoke, that doesn't count. And often this disparagement is expressed in terms of jokes that diminish women's colleges. As a Wellesley graduate, I've had to cringe and sit in a number of meetings where, well, we can't have people from Wellesley. And finally, I just got up, the, the, this person couldn't pronounce it correctly, my dean, and I said, <laughs> I said, hey, uh, that's Wellesley, that's my alma mater. We've had two secretaries of state. And I felt that was the only thing. <laughs> Um, I'm not in his good books at the moment, but I'm glad I did it. Uh, but the question is to me, uh, especially in the humanities and the liberal arts, so many of our outstanding scholars are teaching at, are trained uh, at, at one point, liberal arts colleges. And how do you as a group, and particularly uh, you at UVA, recognize the importance of liberal arts college is of uh, women who have been trained in these places and speak up uh, and speak out in this new climate. I mean, maybe what I'm witnessing on my campus is unusual, but I don't think it's unique. Well, I don't think this is also limited to the, you know, to the influence of the STEM fields, um, but I think it has a lot to do with research institutions seeking to emulate other research institutions. And yes. so the reasoning goes this way. If we're going to vote for you for tenure in a doctoral granting department, then we have to have somebody else from a doctoral granting department who knows what it takes. That's the reasoning. Yes. Now, I think that should be a rebuttable presumption, but it does mean that the burden of proof shifts to the person who wants to argue for a reviewer from a different kind of institution. However, that does happen. So in biomedical engineering, you might well have a reviewer who comes from, say, the pharmaceutical industry and is not even an academic at all, but is reviewing the research. So, you know, I think that's something to have conversations with. Who don't, don't have this conversation in the context of a pending tenure decision. Have it when you're talking about <laughs> policies exactly, about, about tenure. Policy. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. right, because it's really a policy level issue. Otherwise, it will be dismissed as you just didn't like the decision that was made in this case. Um, but as I say, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's limited just to the STEM fields. I think this is, but I do think it's a research university thing. Hi, my name is Ann Lewandowski, and I'm a researcher with the Education Advisory Board, and I was lucky enough to have three presidencies during my time as an undergrad, ranging from Larry Summers to Derek Bach to Drew Fast. My question is about perceptions of women leaders. I think we commonly hear that traits that are perceived as positive in men 
are often perceived negatively as and when they're coming from a woman and let's just label these traits assertiveness and I was wondering if that's some is that something you think about when you're thinking about your leadership style and how you present yourself or is that something that you almost can't even allow yourself to think about I think that the most important thing about really being a great leader is to be really authentically who you are so, and, and, and if you aren't, then it is going to come across as something that people don't want to hear because it doesn't feel right to them, uh, because it isn't representing you. Um, and you have to figure out how to be comfortable with that, how to create the moments when you need to make directives or make decisions and still be who you are in, in, in doing that. I, you know, I go back to, uh, we, we talked a little bit, just touched on it, this sort of, what are the sort of, uh, are there sort of gendered ways of being leaders? And men are leaders in one way, and women are leaders in another way. Men are assertive and um, you know, aggressive and strong and um, you know, fact-oriented, and women are, they have the other kind of characteristics. And you can tell by my, the tone of my voice that I don't really buy this kind of stereotypical thinking. What I think is that we all have a toolbox, if you will, of things that we can uh, use, if you will, in, in our leadership style that's authentically us, that we can, you know, sometimes I can be strong and sometimes I can be assertive and sometimes I'm a listener and sometimes, you know, I'm very fact-based and sometimes I uh, am an intuitive in what I do. But whatever it is, it's what feels right to me as a person and represents me as a person. I kind of laugh at this sort of stereotype because I was at a meeting in Hong Kong last year. Uh, it was a meeting specifically um, held by the Asia Society to bring together um, women leaders in Asia and to ask what is leadership, what is leadership for women in Asia? What does it look like? And one of the things that was kind of interesting is we always talk about male leadership versus female leadership in the United States. They look at that as sort of, you know, that's, when you talk, describe American leadership in terms of male leadership style, that's really American. That's not about male and, and female. So, you know, it has nothing to do with Asian leadership style. So there's some lessons to be learned here that I think means that we have to think about what is it authentically that we are as people and what is our leadership style? How does it come out of that organically? I, I totally agree with that. I think that's so important, the authenticity. But, you know, I do think we would be kidding ourselves if we don't say that there is a... <clears throat> I think for many women, there's a kind of an extra step. You ask, do you think about these things? Do you, you know? Um, and, and let's just talk physicality. Uh, I think most of us are familiar with the studies that show the correlation between height and income. All right? I'm 5'2". <laughs> <laughs> so, and mostly when we find ourselves among groups of presidents, I think I haven't done the study, it would be a fun one to do. I think most of them are six feet tall, right? So just there's a sheer difference. And, and I think that at some level, often we do need to be aware of that. I've been in many, many boardrooms where it still occurs that a woman will say X, it's completely ignored, and 10 minutes later, a man will say X and it's brilliant. You know, it, and we do still wrestle with that. And I think at some level, we've probably figured out ways to accommodate, make accommodation, if you will, and cope with some of those things. You know, I'd say one more thing, which is, in a job like this, you cannot be thin-skinned. As soon as you've made a decision, you've made an enemy. <laughs> and that enemy is going to look for a way to characterize why you made the wrong decision. And gender is as good a reason as any. And so the criticisms are often gendered, whether the behavior really was or not. And I think you just have to be prepared for a certain amount of that to happen. Unfortunately, if you're a member of a racial minority, it may also be racist in tone. If you uh, are an immigrant, it may be nationality-based. But it's, it's simply the way people construct criticism. Uh, I'm Sherry Glassby. I'm a proud Vassar graduate. <laughs> Uh, my dad, that my son also went to Vassar, so um, I was there uh, when it was an all-female school, and I was uh, one of uh, 
very, very few, less than a handful of physics majors. Uh, and I did go on and become a scientist and um, in industry rather than academia. And I have a two-part question. Um, uh, I have had the experience of being in a leadership position in industry, which is, uh, also has its uh, challenges, shall we say. Uh, but one part of the question is, uh, as CEOs of your institutions, do you um, reach out or partner with or have any uh, informal or more formal interactions with your counterparts in industry, female, uh, leaders of major companies because I think that there's a lot of synergy there and a lot of things that can probably be um, uh, taken advantage of. Uh, the other part of the question, uh, which is also related to science education, a little different than the STEM education question that was asked before, and that is as women leaders uh, at your institutions, what are you specifically doing? What initiatives do you have to get the numbers up? We heard in the introductory remarks very clearly that uh, despite the uh, increased numbers of women in, uh, in, in academic institutions, certainly the number going into science has not, uh, has not uh, borne fruit. Well, the most important thing for science education is to get undergraduates excited about science and major in science. Uh, from an all-women's college perspective, it's really exciting to create, I think, the, um, the programs and incentives and, and have the great faculty that will inspire women to go into science in particular. And, uh, you know, one of the things I think about science that really hasn't been talked about a lot is in, in terms of thinking about careers. Students today come to a liberal arts college and they explore the kinds of things they might like to do and then they settle on kind of an, a major. Somebody majoring in classical studies, for instance, uh, can major in classical studies but can go out and have just about any kind of career they want to have using that as their major or that as their background. Same with history, same with religion, et cetera. If you think about a science major, the perception really is that if you're a science major, the opportunities you have in terms of careers are somewhat limited, much more limited than if you were a major in, in a non-science field at a liberal arts college. So I think to some extent we need to think both about how we can construct a science undergraduate program that will inspire, inspire students to want to go on and be those bench scientists like I was, because we need that as part of our national competitiveness, and at the same time to say, recognize that the, the country really needs a more um, science savvy enterprise as a whole. We need more people as lawyers, as bankers, as lobbyists, as senators, as presidents, uh, who, who have a strong background in science. And so if we could think about encouraging our students to think about majoring in science as being able to lead to a, uh, to a life that could uh, offer them many kinds of careers, I think we'd be much more successful in getting people to major in science. And that's one of the first things we have to do. Your no, point I'm, about um, uh, just your point about connecting uh, women CEOs, if you will, in education and in other sectors, I, I think is an important one, and there are not many connections there. Um, we've been looking at that in, in the organization I mentioned, but maybe others have more of that. But I, I think, as so often, we've, we've siloed a little bit about academics, yeah. academics only speaking to academics. Yeah, that's. I'm really fortunate to have two women CEOs on my board. And I've certainly learned a lot working with them, and, and I hope through knowing them to be able to meet some others as well. Excellent. I wasn't sure whether your question was also focused on how we can increase the pipeline of women leaders in academics. And I think there what probably all of us do is, is uh, watch out for our, our young faculty and make sure that they get through, and also that we offer them interesting opportunities along the way. And I think the, one of the, the, the best ways, and I don't know whether each of us did it, was but to get into some kind of a leadership role at the dean's level um, or at, um, as a faculty leader, and that's really a pipeline. Uh, good, uh, <clears throat> good evening. Um, I'm a third year student from UVA, uh, and my question concerns the untapped potential of female leadership um, at these universities, uh, and more specifically, um, undocumented 
uh, Latinas uh, that do not have the opportunity to go to these colleges because of whatever legislation. And uh, I just, my specific question is, what uh, are your schools' policy on uh, the DREAM Act? And uh, if you've accepted it, what have been the benefits, the cons, and uh, uh, I know that there's a difference between public and private, yeah. uh, but um, I just want to get your opinion on that. We have um, a number of students and faculty who are very involved in um, lobbying for the DREAM Act. Uh, it's, the DREAM Act has not been passed yet, as you know, and so to some extent, there, I think it's not the only area where there are perhaps uh, laws that we wish were different, mm -hmm. but that we don't have an opportunity to annul on our own. <laughs> so. I believe the constraint on the DREAM Act is really that you can't get federal aid, so schools can, if you're private nonprofit, um, so that, for example, we have undocumented students. Mm -hmm. Oh, we do. President Sullivan? Well, and as you say, in, in the public institutions, it's different. Mm -hmm. And so in the state of Virginia, for example, as I understand the law there, um, an undocumented student can be admitted, but not as, uh, not for resident tuition. They have to be treated as non-residents. Um, but I spent most of my academic career in the state of Texas. Um, and in Texas, the rule was if you graduated from Texas high school, then you were a Texas resident, you could be admitted. And um, when you live in Texas, you realize that the notion of documented, undocumented, it's actually a pretty recent issue because up until 1965, actually 1968, the border was completely open. And so there was, you know, people, and even to this day, people commute to work back and forth across the bridges. And so the sense of who's documented and who's undocumented is really fuzzy. Yeah. Um, people have family living on both sides of the border. So in Texas, I think it was, uh, it was le in some ways less controversial than it is the further north you get. Mm -hmm. um, and w one of the things about the DREAM Act will be the, the relative conflict between federal state law on that and how that gets resolved. Thank you. We have the last question. Hi, I'm Emily Porter. Um, I'm coming from the perspective of someone who has been a teacher at um, George Mason University and Northern Virginia Community College, um, and now I'm in the Department of Education. And so I've, I kind of have straddled both worlds, and I'm in love with the idea of uh, academic administration. And I'm interested in the, the way that you now see academic administration, you, people getting PhDs and masters in that. And I was wondering about your perspectives in that. Does that actually prepare you, or do you feel that being um, a teacher and you know, it's, it sounds as though most of you all have sort of brought on your experiences in your field to help you as presidents. And do you feel that that's more important than perhaps getting a master's in administration? So just, I just find that interesting. That's, that's really interesting uh, because in many ways the skills that you're going to need uh, to do the job well are often administrative skills. And yet I think it's absolutely core that you have a PhD in an academic subject so that you're you can really uh, kind of understand the lives of the faculty. They're, mm -hmm. they're key to the institution. And uh, I just think it would be very difficult. It's so much easier having been a faculty member, being somebody who does research, who teaches, who knows exactly what their lives are like to, to, to lead that group that's just so important to the institution. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because in some ways we don't really know the answer yet because these kinds of programs really haven't been in existence all that long. And so it'll be interesting to answer the question 20 years from now. But I'd go back to my uh, statement that institutions uh, are quite diverse. There's just a lot of different kinds of institutions with different kinds of cultures uh, associated with them. There are large institutions, universities, that um, where um, perhaps uh, having someone at a major administrative level that's gone to a, one of these uh, M, um, master's or PhD programs would fit in quite well. Maybe more difficult in a small liberal arts college where the faculty have some expectation that you are a scholar in your own right as a president. Now, that's not true for every single liberal arts college. There certainly are people who have come in that have not been of the faculty. But it's still 
a cultural thing again. And so I think it's going to depend a little bit on the kind of institution and its receptivity to that kind of, uh, that kind of training. And I think we're seeing presidents move into the presidency from uh, wow. a sort of non-traditional route. Right. Uh, they've been general counsel. Mm -hmm. They have been the vice president for development. Senators. The, Yep. Senators, Vice President for Student Affairs, it's, it's not always the traditional faculty line. Um, but I do think the majority still come out of the pretty traditional faculty line. Uh, on the other hand, I would say that I think that no matter what your field of study is, you know, what's important is, is not so much what you studied, it's what you've done with it later on. Mm -hmm. And so you could become the chair of a Department of Educational Administration, become the dean of a school of education, and then you're on the traditional track. <laughs> it's true. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists for taking such a uh, t time out to, to explain everything to us mm -hmm. and for bringing all their schools with them. And, <laughs> and uh, I thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you very much.